wonder why Iraqi soldiers can't do jumping jacks to save their lives? We'll find out today on this episode of The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, welcome to The Hot Zone. Today's episode is a special interview with Dr. Ken Pollack. He's a former CIA intel analyst. He wrote an interesting book about why Arab armies seem to always fail even when they should be winning. Check it out. Why don't you just introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, then tell us a little bit about your new book. Sure. My name is Ken Pollack. I am a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I started out life as a CIA military analyst, did a couple of tours on the NSC, uh, and I've written 10 books on the Middle East. My newest book is called Armies of Sand, The Past, Present, and Future of Arab Military Effectiveness. And it's really an effort to kind of uh, dig into this, this great mystery of modern Middle East security of why is it that Arab armies have so consistently performed poorly? Right? Why is it that every time they fight a war, they either lose and often lose badly and often lose in circumstances where simply by you know, any material balance, they should have done much better or even won. And, and when they do win, why is it that their victories are often so modest, even Pyrrhic? Right. And so I, I look at a whole variety of different explanations that people have given over time, politics, economics, culture, uh, reliance on Soviet methods of operations, uh, to ask the question, find out what's really been ailing the Arab militaries for so long. So probably the most recent example, or at least the uh, most recent one that I can think of off the top of my head, is the Iraqi army being absolutely routed by about 750 ISIS fighters and leaving behind billions of dollars of American military hardware, very high tech stuff, and just running away when ISIS came in. Uh, it, would that be a good case in point? Absolutely. And, you know, I'll start by saying that it's cases like that one that are part of the, the motivation for writing the book and why this book is relevant why this is not just an academic consideration. You know, as you point out, the United States has been trying to build up Arab militaries for, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 years, depending on when you start counting. And the truth is, we really haven't been able to do it. And, you know, some of the fault is ours, but the bigger issue is it's not like anyone else has done any better. You know, the Russians tried as well. Uh, and, you know, what's interesting, and I've got it in the book, is, you know, the Russians have the same kind of complaints about their Arab allies that we have about ours. And the same thing for the British and the French, etc. So there has been this pattern. And of course, you know, when you think about American policy toward the Middle East right now, clearly a lot of Americans would love to see us disengage from the Middle East. But one of the problems that we've got is exactly what you're talking about. The idea is we build up our Arab allies so they can stand on their own two feet. That allows us to pull back. But the simple fact is then we see things like the collapse of the Iraqi military in 2014, and it makes it clear they're not ready to. They're not able to. Pretty frustrating to sit and watch. You know, we've pumped so much blood and treasure into Iraq and Afghanistan. And all you have to do is go and spend a little bit of time with those soldiers and see that. I mean, that, you just watch them do jumping jacks and it just make you shake your head in disgust. You just like seriously there. It's, it's like teaching a bunch of trying, trying to get four year olds to become warriors. And uh, so what what's the answer? I mean, what is it that makes them so bad at, uh, you know, waging war? Sure. And yeah, this is the this is the sixty four thousand dollar question. And, you know, I've I've had that same experience. Right. I travel frequently to the Middle East, spent a lot of time uh, at training uh, facilities in places like Iraq and had seen those same things and experienced the frustration of our military personnel. So in a nutshell, I understand this is a big book. I try very hard to treat each of these topics in a very careful, nuanced way. But the bottom line is that it is a combination of their political issues, 
their economic issues, and most important of all, cultural wants, right? And, you know, what you should take away from that immediately is, look, these are not the kind of problems that can get, get, that can get solved by a few hundred American trainers for a few years. Heck, it's not the kind of set of problems that can be solved by a few hundred American trainers working for tens of, twenties of years, uh, decades. Uh, these are deeper societal problems. Mm -hmm. And until you start to see a generational shift, you know, all the American training in the world isn't going to fix those problems. And so instead, one of the things that I recommend coming out of the book is that we've got to approach our military relationships with our Arab allies very, very differently. We're not going to be able to turn them into little U.S. militaries. That's just not in the offing. And instead, we got to think about, A, what kind of capabilities do they have that we can take advantage of? And they've got some capabilities. We can build some small elite forces like the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service, right? The CTS, the famous Golden Division, what did all of the fighting against ISIS from 2014 to 17. Or like what the Emiratis sent down into Yemen, another very small elite force. So there's that. And then we also have to think about partnering with them in very different ways, not asking them to do things that they can't do, recognizing that we're going to have to do those things and only ask them to do things that they are capable of doing. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense, because, you know, as I've reported on the bo both wars over the last 15 years, you know, I've seen I've often said that how can we expect these guys to uh, adopt our methods to adopt our our cultural mindset when they're coming from a culture that literally has not figured out toilets yet. Uh, I mean, they, you go to Afghanistan, most of those people have never used a fork. They've never used a light switch. They've never uh, uh, seen paved roads. They've never slept in an actual bed. That I'm, I mean, you're you're talking fifth century culture with Kalashnikovs and cell phones, uh, and, and it, we not only that, but when we have endeavored to take their 12 or 17 percent literacy rate and try to get it up to 30 percent, perhaps we've pretty much failed spectacularly at that. But but nevertheless, even in so doing, with with establishing massive schools literacy uh, programs, the only thing that we are allowed to teach them to read is the Quran. And so in reality, what that I think has led to is this great green on blue problem uh, in Afghanistan, especially where, you know, we're we're making these guys literate in in Muslim uh, scripture and they're starting to realize, oh, that's what the scripture says I'm supposed to do to infidels. And they're and, and they're murdering us. Now, I, I could be completely wrong about that, but I I, I was kind of shocked when I visited the literacy school and found that the only thing they were allowed to teach them was uh, from the Hadith and, and, and from the Quran. Uh, what, are, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, I think that's a great set of observations. And let me make a, a couple of points off of that because there's so much good stuff in there. And first, some of what you're talking about, you know, as I said, there's a, it's a combination of different factors. And, and part of what you're talking about is economic underdevelopment, right? As you pointed out, these are not advanced societies. And so one of the things that we've consistently seen, and this is true for a broad range of societies, but you know, my book is obviously about the Arab armies, is as you point out, they don't have the same familiarity with technology that we do, right? And so you, know, you put these guys in a tank, you put them in an airplane, they really don't understand how it works the way that even the average American or European would, just because our greater level of development means we come into contact with cars, telephones, TVs, et cetera, on a much more, on a much more regular basis. Yeah. And that's absolutely another piece of this. But coming back to the, to the cultural piece, you know, you're absolutely right. And look, you know, they are susceptible to all kinds of religious preaching. And you know, I think the truth is it's not the Quran. It's certain interpretations of the Quran. Yes. But there's another really important piece of what you talked about, which is it's not just what they're learning. It's how they're being taught. Right. Those those schools that you saw, I, I will bet my mortgage that what you saw was rote memorization. Yeah. Right. That's how they teach the Quran. And frankly, that's how they teach everything. 
right? That's how they teach in their secular schools as well. All through the Arab world, it is all what they call the Quranic method, which is just rote memorization. And there is no critical thinking and there's no initiative and there's no innovation, no creativity. They beat that out of people, right? right? And so not terribly surprising when you put those guys out on the battlefield, they have not been taught to think for themselves. They have not been taught to take action. And that's why, you know, what you find with the Arab armies in particular is their junior officers are terrible. Yeah. They do not know how to function so, on well, a modern very, battle. Very, very, very <laughs> selfish, I would say, in my in my understanding. Now, I, I think that kind of comes back, in my opinion, to the the foundational precepts of our culture that most Americans just take for granted, whether or not they have any religious background or anything. And that is the the, the golden rule. And that is the, the do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That is put other people ahead of yourself. You know, the, the, that whole concept of he who would be first shall be last and he who would be last shall be first. Those are just found that that Judeo-Christian mindset is foundational to our culture. And it comes out in so many ways. But we don't even realize it until you go to a culture like Afghanistan or Iraq and see a culture that's based on pretty much the polar opposite of that, which is more do unto others before they do unto you, take from him before he takes from you. And so you, what you have is, the, for example, the supply sergeant in Iraq who is being given supplies by the United States, tires, motor vehicle parts, whatever, and, and his job is to make sure that the, the guys out in the field have what they need to keep their tanks and vehicles running. But instead, he's looking at his full shelves of tires and he's saying, man, a full shelf is a good shelf. And so when the guys come and ask for tires, he's not going to give them up because then he'll have a hole right there. And he won't he, he, he doesn't want to give to help others. He wants to keep for himself. And that's why we see so much corruption, just endemic corruption there. Uh, and, and, and at all levels, especially in the Afghan army, where we had whole divisions of ghost soldiers that were being paid. And really, all that money was just going to serve the general because those soldiers didn't actually exist. And so it's almost like they don't have an impetus to better their society. They only have an impetus to better themselves. And it is and the whole society is worse for it. And we we have a hard time understanding that because we come from a completely opposite society. Yeah, I mean, I'll start by saying, yeah, I, I don't know Afghanistan nearly as well as you do, as I, I mostly focus on the Arab world. But, you know, I, one of the points you made there, I just think is so important, which is that most of the time you don't, and especially Americans, we don't recognize culture. Mm -hmm. First, as you point out, culture is just the way that we do things. Yeah, and we have field. a tendency to assume that everybody does it the same way, right? Because it just makes sense. It just makes sense to us. And it's only when you encounter very different people that you realize, wow, you know, they, they don't do it the same way we do it all, right? And so that's part of it. The other part of it is that, you know, one of the, when I started working on this, someone said to me, a very wise person, an anthropologist said to me, you know, anytime you start working on a foreign culture, you're going to learn as much about your own culture. Right. It's inevitable. And one of the things I learned about American culture, which is fascinating, is that a, a critical element of American culture is to deny the existence of culture. Yeah. Right. I mean, think about it. What we are taught from, you know, when we're knee high to a grasshopper from the earliest age, we are taught we're all the same under the skin. We all want the same things. We all believe, right? You know, only Americans could come up with, you know, these universal values that we yeah. believe are universal, right? You, you know, the truth is that's not true at all, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, other cultures are evil or something like that. It's just they have different priorities. They Very emphasize much. this opposed to that. And we don't see it, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You, yeah. Which is part of the reason. Exactly what you're getting at. It's part of the reason why we assume, well, you know, our system works for us. It should work for everybody. Yeah. So, of course, we can teach Afghans or Iraqis or Egyptians to fight the same way that we do, not recognizing that, no, they come from a very different society and the strengths and weaknesses they have are completely different from ours. And we built a system to accommodate our strengths and weaknesses, which isn't necessarily going to fit theirs. Yeah, and there's got to be a way to work within their own culture to mo find the way that they are motivated 
and to play to those motivations. One of the things that I've seen in Iraq is that they their culture tends to follow the strong horse. So if so, so they really respect shows of strength. And so if we are perceived to be the strong horse, we've got a lot of people wanting to join our side. But the minute we show the slightest amount of weakness, what we perceive as grace or what we perceive as being polite or friendly, they perceive as being weak. And then they we start losing their support because of that. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and you know, again, it is it's one of the things I talk about quite a bit in my book, which is that, you know, Arab culture is a very top down culture. Their hierarchies were top down. You know, the guy at the top makes all the decisions and the guys at the bottom, it's all guys, unfortunately, but Mm -hmm. the guys at the bottom, they do nothing without explicit orders from somebody at the top. So it's a very authoritarian culture. And what that means is, yeah, whoever is at the top who is showing the greatest strength, that's where people go to. Right. They follow, as you said, they follow the strong horse. Right. And that has lots of different ramifications. It's part of the reason, you know, it's something I talk about a lot in the book, you know, industrial age warfare. There's a lot of bottom up in there. Right. You need your sergeants, lieutenants, captains, majors, smart, thinking for themselves, creative, seeing opportunities on the battlefield and taking advantage of them fast. Arab culture teaches the exact opposite of yeah. that. Right? And that is yeah. why they have struggled. In, yeah. in modern combined arms warfare. The whole concept of initiative is unknown to them and and uh, it's almost punished. And, it, you know, it's punished, uh, again, not right. just from a military standpoint, but in their entire culture. And that's why in Afghanistan, for example, you have a 6,500 year old culture that hasn't figured out paved roads yet because they, they're, that kind of taking, you know, making the world around you a better place is, is unheard of in there. And I like how you put it that, uh, you know, in our culture, it's like, American culture, America is about we're all in this together and we're all trying to make the world a better place. And their culture, it's uh, it's me against my brother, me and my brother against the, the tribe, me and my tribe against the 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 the, the nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's really just a mirror, a polar opposite to what we're talking about. And we've got to learn to work within their culture and not try to make them a Jeffersonian democracy like ours. Uh, and, and we never will. We'll we'll always fail if we try to make them into a Jeffersonian democracy. So, well, we're we're out of time. But uh, Dr. Pollock, I really appreciate uh, you taking a little bit of time to talk to us. And I'm going to recommend to everybody that they go get your book. Uh, I've got a copy of it, and I'm uh, going to power my way through that as soon as I start taking some long airplane flights, uh, where I do most of my reading. And so, I really appreciate you, and uh, uh, thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, and I hope you enjoy the book. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.